This is a bit of a challenge. Post lunch, I'm going to talk about coagulation and causal inference and do the deep dive. Like a third of you just grabbed your phone, so just try to bear with me. Hopefully, I'll keep your interest um, as we move through. So what I'd like to do is quickly go over some of the studies linking coagulation to clinical risk among persons with HIV, and then delve a little bit into the co potential causal pathway for how HIV-associated alterations in coagulation uh, might be influencing disease risk uh, beyond cardiovascular disease into other end organ diseases, such as the frailty phenotype, and kind of emphasize a few experimental interventions which we've done targeting coagulations in persons with HIV and what we've learned from that, and then kind of end with some of the central questions. And so keeping to the 10 theme, maybe a little more than 10 years ago, this Sentinel paper came out um, from the SMART trial, which was a really important trial for a number of reasons. But one of the key features of the SMART trial was that 90% of the deaths were non-AIDS defining. That was very different from clinical outcome trials at the time, which were typically AIDS or death. These were non-AIDS causes of death. And so uh, it was very puzzling in a lot of ways. And, um, some of the, the leaders of the study got their Rolodex out and got Rush Tracy and Lou Culler involved to try to advise them and understand a little bit about what might be causing these non-AIDS deaths. And here, just some of the uh, sentinel findings with the D-dimer and IL-6. I'll emphasize two things. Um, one is that the risk, the odds ratio for fourth versus first quartile of 12 for D-dimer is much more extreme than would typically be shown in the general population for these types of relationships, where we're typically around an odds ratio of two. And the other is that D-dimer levels were higher than what would be reported in the general population. And uh, since that, one of the better studies that sort of exemplifies that came from Matt Freiberg when he was able to get um, specimens from patients before seroconversion to HIV, after, before treatment, and then after antiretroviral therapy, and showed that even <clears throat> after treatment and viral suppression, D-dimer levels were 75% elevated when compared to pre-seroconversion. So um, higher levels in a, a really stiff, stiff sorry, uh, steep risk gradient uh, for non-AIDS-related mortality. And we've since gone through a number of studies where we've measured D-dimer, uh, this one being one where we had uh, 3,700 patients on antiretroviral therapy, followed for many years, a pooled cohort here where we looked at um, higher risk for serious non-AIDS or death over many years of follow-up with higher D-dimer levels, and you can see the distribution of the events there. And there's been a number of studies since uh, linking elevated D-dimer to end organ disease risk, uh, all-cause mortality, CVD, as well as other organ diseases and um, grade four adverse events in the frailty phenotype specifically. So one other point um, before we delve into this a little bit is just that uh, the coagulation pathway is probably important, uh, independent of inflammation. And so these are some of that same cohort. This is IL-6 and D-dimer relationships with serious non-AIDS or death. And then the top part are the hazard ratios for the individual markers, so higher levels and higher risk of these endpoints. And then at the joint model below, you see an attenuation, but still, uh, D-dimer independently associated with these events, even after considering the effects of IL-6. So again, that coagulation represents maybe an overlapping but still distinct pathway for disease uh, than inflammation and worthy of its own sort of interrogation. So what I'd like to now do is kind of try to delve in a little bit and understand if these associations between D-dimer levels and clinical endpoints um, is uh, representative of a causal relationship of coagulopathy on the spectrum from HIV infection to these diseases. And when thinking about these types of relationships, it's important for us to consider uh, several factors or limitations um, as we sort of approach the data. And one, the presence of uh, confounders, <clears throat> which we know can associate with the event as well as the intermediate or the exposure. Um, and you can adjust for these if you can measure them and if you know what they are. Um, in this particular situation, it's important for us to be mindful of sort of reverse causality or, as it were, sort of an end organ disease that might actually be contributing to changes in coagulation, which are going to become relevant for this discussion. But then ultimately, I think mediators are really what we're trying to identify, which are either partially or fully sort of on that pathway that they explain the associations we're seeing. Um, I mean, some examples of confounders classically would be age, smoking. Um, but sometimes it's not so clear where to put things. Things something like liver disease could be considered a confounder for a different end organ outcome like renal disease, but it could also be, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, it could also be a cause of reverse causality. 
and, uh, and potentially in mediators I'll show with decreased uh, hepatocyte function potentially be in a way in which HIV contributes to coagulopathy. So I think it's important how, what questions you're asking in terms of where you place some of these factors as well. So the first, uh, one of the first things um, that I was involved with with Russ was tr to try to sort of understand the influence of HIV on the coagulation cascade. Quite simple task, right? It's a, lot of, a couple of things to measure. Let's just see what it says. So it actually, I'm being facetious. It was quite challenging. It's taken me now many years to try to sort my own brain through this, but I'll try to do it in a few slides. This is sort of uh, uh, representing both procoagulant in green and anticoagulant in red factors that ultimately, at the end of the day, influence the degree of thrombin generation, which you can then model with thrombin generation and resolution. And it depends not just on one of these factors, but obviously the relationship or the composition of all of them. And so um, what we did then is measure these factors in a couple different samples in the SMART study. And I'll spend this slide just to go over the design because I think it's important because it really sort of adds some robustness to our findings. So if you remember SMART, the patients could be either on or off treatment at entry. So we have a comparison of a subset at baseline off treatment and those on with the suppressed virus. But then the, the randomized intervention in SMART was different for those two groups. So if you're off ART, you could either stay off or start. And if you're on ART, you could either uh, continue to be on it or stop. So what we have are reciprocal randomized comparisons of untreated versus treated HIV. And so with all three comparisons, I'm only going to actually show the, the baseline comparisons of on and off ART because no matter whether we looked at the randomized comparisons in either direction or that, we got the same signal, the same markers going in the same directions. So I think our findings are very robust in the sense that we were able to show it three different ways. Um, but for time, I'll sort of just focus on, again, that first one. So here's the factors that we measured in this box and the effect of untreated HIV infection versus viral suppression. So clearly some markers going up, some markers going down. It's hard to establish patterns. Some procoagulants, um, for example, factor eight. Um, ooh, that does work well. Factor eight is up, that's a procoagulant. But then fibrinogen, which is typically procoagulant, it's kind of mitigated, not so up. So what we actually, um, then if we overlay, uh, what I've done here in red boxes is um, the factors or markers that rely on hepatocyte protein synthesis for release. And so then we start to see a pattern of those being either a mitigated increase or a decline. Um, and so uh, there are potentially a variety of reasons for this, but one sort of uh, initial uh, obvious hypothesis is that when you have viremia, your body's gonna have an interferon response, and of the many effects of interferon on cells, it's well established that it inhibits protein synthesis. So that could be one effect we're seeing. And so we're getting both decline or changes in pro and anticoagulant factors um, that are mixed. And so we want to understand the net effect on thrombin generation or thrombin kinetics. And here, um, really methods from uh, a colleague of Russ's at University of Vermont, Kathleen brummel zidens and others in her group have um, really a novel way of sort of modeling thrombin kinetics when considering the totality of the factor composition uh, of those nine markers that we measured. And they're able to really describe uh, procoagulant states of disease versus no disease um, and kind of understand what the main drivers of that procoagulant effect are. And so we applied that to the samples that we were looking at and showed that thrombin generation, total thrombin generation was uh, modeled to be higher um, and peak thrombin generation higher as well and untreated HIV infection versus the treated state. And this is the sort of totality, if you will, of all the factors up in the box on the right, some going up, some going down. But when, she, when Kathleen actually looked specifically, what's accounting for that difference, that increased modeled thrombin generation? It was really uh, increases in factor eight, decreases in some of the anticoagulants, antithrombin and protein C. And, and keep uh, note of those markers because they'll come up here in theme. So uh, we have an effect on increased uh, thrombin kinetics from HIV um, that's largely accounted for by both an increased pro-inflammatory signal and a um, reduction in an anticoagulant response. And so what's the clinical uh, impact of this? So then we took this, these sort of methods and we used a different sample. Here now are patients that are on continuous antiretroviral therapy and we picked cases of mortality, three to one controls, and th these same factors again you can see increased risk um, of mortality with d dimer which is in four, factor eight, and then um, with uh, lower protein C levels. Um, so there's an inverse relationship with mortality with protein C. 
And then what I've done is sort of put the point estimates in red for those that require a patocyte for protein synthesis. You're seeing the pattern of that inverse relationship there as well. And then apply Kathleen's methods and say, okay, between cases and controls, what's the difference when the totality of these markers in those patients um, for thrombin kinetics? And again, uh, patients uh, that ultimately uh, died, that mortality had increased thrombin generation uh, versus controls. And the difference in that thrombin kinetics was largely explained through higher levels of factor VIII and lower levels of antithrombin and protein C, the anticoagulant response. So one of the things that was going on as, as we sort of were sifting through and I was trying to put my, wrap my head around these data was a, a realization that a lot of these same changes actually are what happen with advancing age. And um, many biomarkers increase with aging, but the pattern was something that uh, was quite analogous to what we were describing. There's obviously well known that a lot of inflammatory markers increase with advancing age, but some of these procoagulant factors that we're measuring as well also tend to track with age, factor eight included here. And then many studies have actually shown either a lack of an anticoagulant response that you might predict with those increased procoagulant factors. Um, no change, some, or some actually going down, some going up uh, in a small degree. And so at the end of the day, this sort of pathology uh, in the, on the coagulation system is thought to contribute to increased risk for you know, arterial venous thrombosis, but also actually more complicated uh, phenotypes like the frailty phenotype. Um, it was mentioned the cardiovascular health study where the uh, phenotype, uh, frailty phenotype was measured, and, and in that study, D-dimer and factor VIII uh, were associated with uh, the frailty phenotype, independent of CVD. So even when ex excluding those with CVD, they were able to show those associations. So the impact, I, I think it's poorly understood then what the impact of advancing age on the biology that I'm trying to describe here might be. Um, if it's additive, it could be a substantial impact. It could be sub-additive, but it's really a relationship that I think needs to be uh, interrogated a lot better. Okay, so then the other sort of HIV-related mediator that's really important to bring up is something that's widely hypothesized in the field, which is this notion that in HIV infection, you get this damage to mucosal surfaces, that infector site where the immune system doesn't fully recover, leading to uh, microbial, uh, basically uh, loss of integrity at the mucosal surface as well as other effects. Uh, microbial translocation, which is kind of a low-level endotoxemia. And we know, um, at least from states of sepsis, more extreme examples of endotoxemia, that this has big effects on the coagulation system, largely in terms of LPS um, binding through sort of innate cells like monocytes and, and stimulating tissue factor pathways, which can actually then cause, you know, microvascular disease and tissue injury. And so this probably a much lower degree of that endotoxemia, but potentially still a hypothesis for how HIV might be mediating a, a coagulopathy. And Nick Funderberg probably has some of the most sentinel studies uh, looking into this hypothesis and has shown that LPS levels correlate with tissue factor expression on monocytes and D-dimers actually correlate with tissue factor expression on monocytes as well among persons with HIV. He also did some functional studies, which I think are important to point out, where he actually showed the subset of monocytes um, that really upregulate tissue factor, these so-called petroleum monocytes are sometimes called uh, non-classical monocytes, these uh, uh, DIM and CD14 and express CD16. And so on the right panel, you can see when he exposes these cells to LPS or two different strains of uh, HIV, either X4 or X5 virus, upregulates tissue factor expression. And so what we're sort of, I'm trying to make a case for is that we've identified some mediators um, with an HIV infection exposure that could start to explain the coagulopathy that we're seeing uh, in these patients. One, that viral replication itself alters the comp composition of coagulation factors, complex ways, some go up, some go down, but the net effect appears to be increased generation of thrombin. And then another, that this, this hypothesis of damage to mucosal integrity with a low level endotoxemia was upregulating tissue factor pathways. Um, and so that gives us a couple of different mediators along to that stage of this. But at the, the next step, it's more complicated, and that's where we're sort of going to. So uh, certainly with macro level sort of thrombotic events, um, the causal pathway towards 
uh, ischemic cardiovascular disease, I think is a little more intuitive, and I'll go over some data which are supportive of that. And so we can think about potentially many of the causes of mortality also being explained um, through, this, through this pathway. But when we get down to other end organ dysfunction, kidney, liver, brain, or cognitive dysfunction, frailty phenotype, it becomes less clear how um, those diseases, which typically are not associated with macro level uh, thrombosis, might be increased with this, um, these changes in, in coagulation um, pathways that we're describing. And so one feature that potentially also links risk for all these diseases is immune activation or inflammation. And so what we actually, uh, Russ and I and Nigel Key uh, from the University of North Carolina, what we really wanted to do is see if inflammation was a mediator along this step of the pathway such that the activated coagulation system was actually driving inflammation. Um, and there is some precedence for that potentially being true. And so um, I'll go through this sort of schematic to try to <laughs> justify that there was a little more premise to this because I'll show you some studies which ultimately um, uh, were negative just to cut to the chase. But I think it's an important hypothesis, uh, and this is, this is the premise for it. So if you look at the key features of sort of the coagulation cascade, there are several key points along that, factor 10, thrombin, that actually stimulate protease-activated receptors which are present on leukocytes and vascular surfaces. And those, through those receptors, activation of those receptors, increases uh, pro-inflammatory consequences on the vascular surface, in tissues, and, and can actually cause organ damage and inflammation that way. So what we wanted to, to determine was if we experimentally, through a, a randomized clinical trial, intervened on nodes in this pathway, and there's two drugs which um, studies we were involved with, one adoxaban, which is a factor 10A inhibitor, similar to rivaroxaban, and then vorpaxar, which is a direct PAR1 inhibitor. Could we actually impact inflammation beyond the anticoagulant effects? So the first drug, adoxaban, the factor 10A inhibitor, um, we conducted this as a, um, as a crossover study, so randomized a sequence of drug um, and uh, with a washout period in between. And we selected for those that were viral suppression, D-dimer levels over 100, and our outcomes were primarily inflammatory uh, markers as well as looking at the effects on the coagulation system. And so um, what we showed, here I've represented the key sort of inflammatory markers in blue and, and the anticoagulants in red, is that we did show a pretty robust anticoagulant effect with a 42% drop in D-dimer, but we didn't have any impact on, on inflammatory pathways here. And we actually did end up measuring others. I tried my best to find something. It doesn't appear to be moving in a, at least um, in the usual sort of inflammatory markers that we think are relevant for disease risk. Um, but I actually, we did, we tracked ble bleeding and bruising events. Um, we had no severe events, no grade three, four, or serious uh, adverse events related to bleeding, but we did see more uh, events uh, when on active versus placebo. Um, so, you know, raising issues about a long-term strategy of such, even for just a, a sole anticoagulant effect. And then the other study I mentioned was um, on vorpaxar. This is the advice study. This was a straight one-to-one -one randomization with 12-week follow-up. Again, similar eligibility criteria with patients over 40 suppressed virus. Here, D-dimer level had to be over 200 to get in. Um, and um, also no effects on uh, D-dimer in this case, or no effects on the coagulation markers. Uh, they just are plotted out along the graph on the bottom, but the, the summary statistics in the table on top, and then negative impact on IL-6, CRP, soluble CD163, as well as PAR1 expression on T cells uh, in this study. And then just, I think, because I think it's a, just an, another important um, negative study in this context is the ACT study on aspirin. This is a really important study. Three-armed randomized trial, two doses of aspirin, 300, 100 versus placebo. Um, and um, follow-up 12 weeks, I think, as well. Um, largely otherwise healthy patients that were HIV positive patients that were suppressed and were unable to, they did show reduction in thromboxine B2, which shows they were getting an aspirin, which is good, but um, no impact on um, their primary endpoint, soluble CD14, as well as other monocyte or uh, inflammatory immune activation markers. So we're back to this model. I think we have some mediators by which HIV infection might be contributing to uh, increased thrombin generation. 
um, at least through one of our studies, I think it's unlikely that inflammation is a mediator on this process through end organ disease risk. And so we're still left, left with um, how does uh, thrombin or thrombosis or clotting poten potentially on uh, large vessels, macro vessels, how does that explain the disease risk that we're seeing in the associations across multiple end organ diseases? And we have to worry that reverse causality might be at play with some of these endpoints. And so what can we do to try to address that a little bit um, with the observational data that we have? And actually, there are some methods where we can try to get that, it, at that a little bit more. And one is this, um, these methods called Mendelian <laughs> randomization, which leverage genomics and proteomics in large data sets that also have clinical phenotypes. And so the premise here is you have a biomarker level that's associated with clinical event risk and is also associated with a gene variant, or SNP in this case, which itself is associated with uh, the clinical event risk. You can see if that biomarker level mediates the association between the gene and the event. And the pr important premise is that because the gene variant is inherited independent or in a random, random way from the confounder, potential confounders, even unmeasured, uh, it sort of um, protects itself from uh, issues of confounding with these methods. And so it's a way to address unresolved confounding, selection bias, but also first causality, right, because the uh, gene inheritance happens uh, before the event um, in this model, obviously. So these methods applied um, have been more so in the general population. I think there's some HIV cohorts that are well primed to start to do this, but um, you do really need a lot of power and you need the genomics and proteomic data. But it's been studied in the general population looking at ischemic heart disease. So this is where we think uh, intuitively it makes sense with thrombotic risk and endpoints. And so this is one very nice study of these uh, MR methods. These are some of the key factors that I'll point out here, which had associations with genetic variants, uh, D-dimer, PI-1, and TPA at the bottom. Though predictive for events, um, were not significant in terms of causal inference through these methods. And among the ones at the top, um, uh, endogenous thrombin potential actually was the, the one that ended up sort of meeting significance for causal inference because there was some potential confounding with the gene variants in von Willebrand factor and factor eight that actually also associated with increased LDL. So couldn't quite say that's an independent causal. So this supports through different methods, um, you know, the, the pathway of uh, thrombotic events in vessels and ischemic heart disease uh, and increased thrombin uh, potentially being relevant for that. So what if we change the outcome to neurocognitive dysfunction? And so here, it's another nice uh, Mendelian randomization study where they looked at these four measures uh, that were associated with genetic variant, but none of these passed as being significant um, for causal inference through these methods, and they actually restricted to those above age 50 and were unable to show uh, support for causal inference for neurocognitive decline outcome. Uh, so, so we're done, right? First causality, everything else, CVDs, clot. Well, I'm going to pull the, you know, unique population card. So it's not just uh, a technicality that these are general population studies and we're talking about a different disease state. And if you look at one population where you might have a causal pathway through, a, say, a surrogate marker to a clinical endpoint, that may not be um, the causal pathway in another population. And I'll give you a real uh, life example that just sort of came out using the types of interventions that we're talking about. So rivaroxaban, which is adoxaban, you know, same mechanism of action, um, prevents stroke and MI in patients with atrial fibrillation or stable coronary artery disease, but it does not prevent stroke or MI among those with heart failure, and the Kaplan-Meier curve sort of right over itself at the bottom shows that. And it's largely thought because thrombin-mediated events are not the major driver of events among those with heart failure, where it's re more relevant in those with stable coronary artery disease. And so when you're thinking about an intervention that might be beneficial to two different populations, you might be right on the causal pathway in one and, um, and not in a beneficial pathway for the other population. So I think understanding this in the context of HIV patients is, um, is really important and at least really trying to delve into it a little bit further. I'm going to skip that point just for the sake of time. And so I got kind of a one last sort of plug for potential mediator for how um, you know, alterations in coagulation that are caused by HIV might be contributing to disease risk in multiple organ systems. And 
This is, um, these are S SIV macaque data, so this is animal model data uh, where Ivana Pendrea and, um, and Russ Tracy were involved in sort of showing that at sort of untreated SIV infection, increased levels of D-dimer with higher viral loads, and at the end of the day on, on necropsy, they were able to show capillary sort of thrombotic events and capillary beds in multiple organ systems. And so, you know, certainly a hypothesis, nothing proven by this pathway, but it's um, suggestive of something that low-level tissue injury in a microvascular bed could be one possible way um, where over many, many years um, you do have uh, damage through multiple organ systems. Um, so I think there are still some areas that um, uh, lend themselves to investigation. So in summary, I think we've got um, a few potential mediators that support um, HIV contributing to a coagulopathy. Uh, we don't, we have a lot more questions than answers in terms of how that coagulopathy translates to end organ disease, again, across multiple end organ systems. And ultimately, the causal relationship um, is still remains unclear, and particularly for those, I guess, non-CVD-related events, if we're going to group them all together like that. So where do we go? Um, uh, you know, it's a, a researcher's list of wants from funders. We want basic science on mechanisms to connect this sort of pathology to end organ damage. Uh, we need clinical studies to understand this phenotype of coagulopathy, specifically now in more contemporary so, um, patients on modern regimens. Uh, I think Carrie brought that up this morning. I mean, we, we've learned a lot from some of these cohorts, but we really need to sort of see how much um, is still persisting with uh, early treatment diagnosis and use of integrase inhibitors more widely. We need to understand what the right target populations are. There really are different groups of risk in, in, in sort of when we're looking at interventions, knowing how to select the, the right target population um, and what candidate surrogate markers we're going to evaluate those interventions on. And I really think an untapped area here is how a, advancing age influences this biology I've been trying to kind of lay out here. Um, you know, is there the, the nature of the interaction, if there is an interaction, um, whether it's subadditive or additive, or in, could this become more of an issue if we're starting to have HIV altering uh, this biology in the same way that it, that it does with advancing age? And then finally, I'll just make a plug for randomized interventions. I think we need to interrogate these different mediators and hypothesized links through uh, well-designed experimental studies um, and leverage uh, large cohorts with genomic and proteomic data. So uh, just really, I guess one of the things I want to emphasize, I've obviously mentioned Russ a few times, uh, Kathleen bromos Idens from Vermont has been uh, heavily involved in a lot of these studies, and Nigel Key as well, and then colleagues from the Insight Group on some of those uh, other studies as well. And I'm really a product of team science and a huge believer in team science. Um, I'm an infectious disease clinician, and you've asked me here to talk about coagulopathy. So that, that's everything to do with the colleagues I work with. So thank you.